Hello! Hello! Welcome! So happy to be here. So happy that you're here for so many reasons. So thank you so much for joining us. Everyone who is here with us, welcome. This is Helios Opera's Bright Spots that we do every Friday. My name is Joanna Pope, and I am so excited to welcome Julia Mortikova. Did I say that correctly? That is perfect. Amazing. Yes, Julia is the artistic director of the Music by Women Festival that is hosted every single year at the Mississippi Women's University. Mississippi University, University for Women. There we are. Yes, Mississippi University for Women. And I'm ex especially so excited because I'm actually from Mississippi originally. I'm from South Jackson, which is in Byron, Byron Mississippi. And I hate to admit that before the last guest um, nominated you, I actually didn't know about the festival, which is super unfortunate. So I'm so excited to dive into this conversation and to get to know you and get, learn so much more about the festival. So welcome, Julia. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. I'm so honored that I was nominated to be able to speak more about the festival and the work that we do. Of course, yes. We're so excited to learn more with you as you explain everything to us. Um, so just to get started, of course, Tell us about who you are, where you're from, what you do, and what your individual music journey has looked like. Sure, so um, I'm currently professor and chair of the Department of Music at the Mississippi University for Women, where I'm also the founder and artistic director of the Music by Women Festival. So I have kind of different hats that I wear, and I'm also a pianist, um, you know, performing mostly solo works by women composers, actually, but also a lot of dual works, also mostly by women composers and other things. Um, and I have been at the W, that's how we call ourselves, uh, since <laughs> 2000 and, 2012. Okay, fabulous. And that's uh, in Mississippi, right? That is in Columbus, Mississippi. The Delta, right? Um, well, um, it's the Golden Triangle. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, so... Um, it's close to the Alabama border is sort of where we are. We're that side of the, of the state. Um, so I'm kind of celebrating my 10 years there. Um, oh. And the festival has been, the, the first year of the festival was 2017. Mm -hmm. So the festival this year will be celebrating its seventh year. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's kind of, kind of what I do. Um, and I have always been a pianist and that's kind of the core of who I am really, despite all these other things. Um, and uh, my uh, mother started me uh, t taking piano lessons when I was a little girl, I was about three, cause she's a composer, Olga Harris, and she's one of the composers I'm a big advocate of. Um, and so from that point on, that's always what I wanted to do. Um, and then at some point during my educational career, doing my master's degree at NYU, I got an opportunity to teach, fell in love with it and thought I would do this. Um, and uh, then I kind of got into leadership roles during doctoral studies. And so I thought, okay, when the chair position became open, I said, I, I'll throw my hand in the ring for that. But um, I kind of discovered during my doctoral studies that um, there were very many prominent women composers who were sort of erased from history. Yeah. And um, that was kind of a new discovery for me because as I mentioned, my mother is a composer. So I never thought, well, where are the women composers? Because I had one <laughs> with me at all times. Um, but I um, kind of started researching Ciso Chaminade. She was the first composer I kind of, yeah, fell in love with. Um, and when I found her um, and started playing through some of her music, I thought, wow, this is such an amazing person. It's such a shame that no one has ever heard her music or knows about her. And then I realized researching that that is completely false and she was really fam famous and all her music was published and she toured the world. And so then I, I just this kind, of, kind of thought this is a, a historical injustice that women who actually did achieve all these things were sort of magically erased and she's still not in the Burkhardt ground Poliska history book, despite, you know, me even speaking to Peter Burkhardt about this <laughs> person. Um, so um, anyway, so that's kind of what kind of led to my journey of discovering Chaminade and then other composers. And then when I applied for the job at the W, the W was the first public institution of higher education for women in the country. It was founded in 1884. Um, and so I thought, what better there is no better place to to start this festival and there were some other festivals of women in music at the time but i think there was maybe two like literally it was not very many at all and so i thought we definitely need more and this would be a great place and so i pitched this idea at my interview and it took a few years but it you know finally came to fruition in 
2017. So that's, that's sort of my life story. <laughs> that's <laughs> That. And actually, Cecile Chaminade actually sang some of her songs in my graduate recital in Boston. I went to Boston okay. graduate school, and I remember singing those songs, and they were so wonderful. Just, I remember thinking the music was just so lovely, and I had never heard of her until I was recognized by a teacher. And I thought, what a shame that, you know, she's not, as you said, in the common repertoire, the canon. Um, but yeah, your work is so inspiring, and I'm so excited to talk more about it. So you've already kind of touched on it, and I actually just learned that the festival was completely your idea. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Um, so can you just give me what you, maybe what your elevator pitch was whenever you went to the board to tell them about what you were thinking, what's the main mission of the festival, and, um, you know, what's this, I know you're artistic director, so what does it mean, what is your role essentially, like, fully, would you describe what you do? Sure. So the idea was I was running around the world playing this music by women composers and thought oh, I'm making a difference here. I'm teaching some music, you know, whatever. But then I actually had a student at the W who was like, hey, I want to compose music, but I don't know any women composers before me. And I thought, well, this is first of all, Clara Schumann was saying this in the 19th century. Second of all, here I am playing all this music, but it's obviously not a trance. So I thought if I create a space for other people to do this, then we can create these ripples and there's like a whole ocean of us now, you know, as opposed to one person trying to do the work. You create the space for hundreds of people to do the work because it's about 150, 200 people come every year to do this. And I'll talk more about it. But so that was sort of the idea. And um, I pitched it to the president at the W when I interviewed for the job. And I said, well, the mission of the university is uh, to provide educational and leadership opportunities for women. Um, and in classical music, there we have this whole area of women composers that is just sort of non-existent. I mean, literally, if you go to a concert and you see a woman on the program, you're like, whoa, it's amazing. should not be like that. You know, no. it should be, <laughs> you should expect something like that. And if you do see a woman, it's usually somebody who's alive today. And that's all fine and dandy. But, you know, my big passion was I always wanted to make sure that we don't forget the ladies who came before us because they're no longer here to advocate for themselves and they need advocates. And so... I'm a big proponent of advocacy, you know, as, a, as an academic leader, for my students, for my faculty, but also for these role models. And it's for me as an educator, it's about having role models that other women, younger women can say, wow, here's this woman who was doing this in the Baroque time period. Here's this woman who was doing this in the 19th century. So of course I can do that. You know, they, but if you don't have those role models or rather you have them, you just don't know about them, then that's kind of, and so, and that was the idea. I wanted to pitch a festival, and it's a, it's a festival and an academic conference. So yeah. it's three days. Um, it's 15 concerts, five concerts a day. And between the concerts, we have the uh, kind of academic sessions running. We have papers and lecture recitals. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's a very eclectic. And, and um, as an artistic director, you asked my, my, my role is I really want to make sure that um, it's peer-reviewed. Uh, but, for example, the new works are actually chosen by the performers. So I have a list of all these performers who volunteer to play. And whenever I have a work, say, for flute and piano, I just send it to the, all the flutists and pianists and just say, you know, who, who wants to play this? And they choose. So it's, it's, it's very different than other, I think, festivals and conferences because it's not like I have this committee of composers who are mostly men sitting there, you know, making these decisions. Oh, oh. <laughs> you know, this is actually the performers. And what happens every year is, so it's about 150 to 200 people. So the performers through the composition of works, the peer review committee chooses the lecture styles and papers and the performances. So a person can submit up to 20 minutes of music to be programmed as a performer, as part of the concerts. Um, and that could be new music, that could be historic music, um, anything. And then composers can submit works uh, for up to 20 minutes uh, also to be programmed on these concerts. And so the concerts are all eclectic. It's not like, here we have a new music concert, we have, no, it's all mixed. So you have a historic work, a new work, historic, new, different instruments, different instrument combinations, just to keep it kind of interesting. Mostly chamber music, of course, because we don't have orchestras. Um, but, you know, we have had or, uh, operas programmed and obviously, you know, smaller um, kind of orchestrations. And, and, and then uh, the lecture recitals and papers are running concurrently, and those are on any topic about women in music. So not even just women composers. We've had papers about women educators, uh, women performers, just any. And um, it's wonderful because I, it's also very diverse. Um, people think, oh, it's uh, <laughs> music by women. It's all the ladies come. No, it's, a, you know, it's a lot of men. It's about half men. 
because they also um, support the work. So that, that was sort of the idea is to make sure that we get music out there, historic music, new music, to, to be a vessel to let other people do the work. But what happens every year at the festival is when people come, they get inspired. So we kind of call it a movement. I like to call it a movement, not a festival. Because they get inspired, they find a composer, they find a work, they look for something for their instrument, they learn it, they program it at other conferences, they come back next year playing something that they heard at the festival before, a composer they heard before. If it's a performer, they need a composer whose music they like, they ask for scores, they program it. So this music gets programmed over and over and over again. It's not like we just do this in March and then we go home and forget about it. Everyone who comes to the festival is very committed, and so they continue spreading those ripple. You know, it's a ripple effect, and that's that's been a wonderful thing. And we've even had several situations. This is why I think the festival is so special, where for you know whatever reason, performer cancels literally it's sometimes twenty four hour notice. And I just sent an email saying, like for example, one year. I had a single cancel and there was a song cycle of four songs and I had three singers step in and sing it on 24 hour notice. A couple of years ago, we had a flutist who had to cancel and I sent an email at 10 p.m. saying we have a flute emergency. We need a flute for a noon concert tomorrow. I had a flutist within, you know, an hour. So that people are just so committed to having this music be heard. And I think that's, that's you know, that's, that, that's the whole mission. The mission is to get the music out there. And as a performer, I think the best way of doing that is to do it on stage because um, you know, we need it in the history books, but I think in order to get it into those history books, it needs to be programmed into yep. the point where people cannot say, oh, this is not important, this was not good, you know, you know all these things, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> the work is so great, and it's well, exactly the ripple effect we need, especially in times right now, considering what's been going on in the political landscape recently. So I really appreciate and respect your work, and I'm so glad that we're going to keep talking about it. So you are in Mississippi and doing this at the W. Um, and for those who've just joined, this again is Julia Mortakova. She's artistic director of the Music by Women Festival at the W, which is the Mississippi University for Women in Mississippi, Columbus, Mississippi. So what's it like ho hosting a festival like this in Mississippi specifically because I'm from there and I find it really interesting that you have this festival in Mississippi so when people come in from all over the world and country what do you suggest for them to do what do you do as far as activities or you just kind of focus on the work you're doing do you find it um, any challenges in a space like Mississippi like because the landscape is pretty conservative any anything you want to say about that would be awesome Sure. So as I said, the reason we chose, well, I chose to do this at the W is obviously because I'm a professor and chair there, but also because it was the first public institution for women in the country. So it had this um, niche of uh, supporting women's work, women's education, women's leadership. And so the university itself has been very welcoming of the festival. And when people come to the festival, it's not like they go to these concerts and then they go home. We really roll out the red carpet for them. We have shuttles that pick them up from the airport and take them to the hotel and then continuously bus them from the hotel to the festival site, to, to the university. So essentially no one needs a car when they come to the festival. They just need to get themselves <laughs> to the Columbus airport and then we'll take care. And then throughout the day of the festival, we have refreshments all day, every day. And then we have receptions every night, which are essentially uh, like a meal. And so we, we, as I said, we have five concerts a day, 10, noon, 2.30, 5 and 8. And between the 5 and 8 p.m. concert, that's when the reception happens. Gotcha. So really, um, there's, and then the hotel that they stay in, uh, Hyatt Place, Columbus, they provide a free breakfast for them. So really, <laughs> there's very little they need to really do. But people do wander off and, and explore. We are pretty close to downtown Columbus, which is a, you know, kind of a, a cute historic town. And uh, people wander around, they walk around, they visit some of the stores. And it's kind of funny because I sometimes attend um, visit visitors bureau meetings for the city of Columbus. And I've had store owners say that um, my festival attendees always make sure to visit stores and to do some shopping and exploring. So they, they do kind of take in the culture. And um, I think it's very important. And this is what I tell everybody that, um, everybody in Columbus that for a lot of people, this is the first time they're in Columbus, they're in Mississippi, they're in the South. I mean, they you know, right. they have no idea. And so it's kind of a cultural experience. I think it's really great. Um, and it's wonderful for my students because they get to meet 
all of these individuals literally from all around the world. I mean, we really have people coming from all over the United States, but we've, we've had every year we have people from Canada, from Mexico, from South Korea, we've had people from Italy, from Russia, from, I mean, just everywhere. And, um, and it's, it's, it's wonderful because um, every single, you know, graduate school is here, every single orchestra, opera company is here. And so most of the people in the festival, I should explain who it is, they're mostly academics, but we also have a lot of independent professional musicians, so orchestra players, opera singers, uh, independent uh, studio teachers there is no age limit of any kind not lower not upper and so we do have every year uh, some graduate students and also some undergraduate students not as many you know a couple but I it, it's it's one of, the, one of the most wonderful things that you know we have an undergraduate student come and sometimes their family comes and they're like this is their first festival you know they're so excited to be there and we've had composers because the performers choose and it's anonymous it's a blind review you know anonymous uh, selection process, students get chosen just as well as the professionals and nobody knows who is, you know, the star composer or not a student, you know, or a student. So they have an equal opportunity. And so they get that chance to have their work performed alongside um, other professional, you know, top notch composers. And some of the student composers have uh, really collaborated with their professional musicians going forward. And these professional musicians program these works on their own faculty recitals. They record them on their own albums they take them to other festivals and so you know i tell stu students i have i had a student who was sad to say, I was like you know you, you're getting this opportunity <laughs> to be recorded by the concert mistress of this orchestra you know on this label i mean it's amazing as an undergraduate it very rarely happens so i that's to me that's that's really wonderful and i would also like to say it's a very warm atmosphere no one feels like okay this is the student section no everybody's just it's like a family you know everybody embraces everyone and People go out to lunch together and give each other rides if they, you know. So it's um, it's a very warm environment, which is why a lot of people come back every year. Um, and yeah, I mean, <laughs> so I, I think I think to answer, I guess, to get back to your question, um, obviously there are things in Mississippi that are you know kind of different from other places. But I think the festival really does its part to sort of you know, bring something different and yeah. uh, bring something from the outside. And I think it's, it's inspiring um, for both people in Mississippi, but also people from the festival to see, to see this other uh, part of the world. So yes. yeah. and like, I mean, you're making a huge wave yourself just in the, the community around you and you're enriching that community and introducing them to so many new experiences and to new music that they would never have heard otherwise. And I think that is so wonderful and it's something we all need to strive to do when we're in this type of industry um and i love what you were talking about how it's the blind audition process or the mm -hmm. blind sharing that's really interesting and i know there's been a lot of talk about you know of course the industry of classical music and even the i mean i'm involved in the opera industry pretty closely and um you know it gets hard because it becomes really political and at times so i think that your work and choosing to make that blind is so Amazing. I think that we need to take a note in a lot of other areas of classical music. So speaking of that, in your experience as a performer, academic, um, professor, all of these things, all of the hats that you wear, have you come across any, you know, challenges in the industry or, or things that could be better to your opinion, you know, like issues that we have within this industry? Because there, I think there are several and I talk to a lot of different people about this, about the gatekeeping and different things. Do you have any ideas about that? Have you come across some issues? Sure. So the one thing, you know, we already talked about the lack of women composers, particularly historic women composers. But um, I also think there is this fascination with this idea of stars. And that's one thing, you know, to go back to that a little bit. In the festival, we have no stars. Everybody's a star at the festival. That's why we have no keynote speakers, no featured composers, no featured performers. And every year I have people like, oh, well, I would like to join. You know, I'm like, no, 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 no. Everybody applies to the same blind peer review process and everybody has an equal chance. And we have uber famous composers on the program along with students on the program and they all get treated equally and i think people enjoy that because it's it gives everybody a chance my whole uh, philosophy is let's give everyone a chance to be heard and everyone's music a chance to be programmed and i, I guess the issue that i have is it's you know if you go to a concert a lot of times it's always the same you know new music composers right who are famous right and there's nothing wrong with that but there's a lot of other composers and so whenever there's a push, okay, let's have a woman come, let's have the same person that everybody else programs. 
you know, it's like, why, why don't we go out and, 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 and have commission somebody else to write something or look for something? I mean, why is it always? So I guess that that's always been my frustration because I feel like even in doing the work, sometimes we get into the cycle where we're doing the same works <laughs> by the same person. Um, and so I think it's, it's important to just be curious, you know, and, and be open to things. I mean, sure, I love Shaminat. Of course, I'm going to program Shaminat. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that the whole festival is going to be music, but it's social media. It, it, it's really not, you know. <laughs> Incredible. It sounds like you need to be running a lot of different companies with your. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. But... Love it. I really, I just respect the work you're doing there. It's just so great. Um, so you've already kind of touched on it a little bit, but can you further talk about the application process? I know that you said that you have a blind interview portion to that so say if someone wants to go and perform music by women mm -hmm. as maybe a vocalist or an instrumentalist or they're submitting as a composer or mm -hmm. as a lecture recital how does that process go um, and who gets to kind of like see the first makings of it sure so it's a blind review process so it's just like any other conference that you apply to and it, the submission form is actually already up the submission forms i should say because there's different forms of course um, on our website which is www.muw.edu slash music by women that's our website muw.edu slash music by women if you google music by women festival probably gonna pop up first so either way is fine um but so it, it's it's a submission form and there, you, you choose which category you want to apply there's no ap application fee or anything like that um, and I should say one of the things I'm mostly committed to is is making sure that we have um, as much inclusion as possible and a big part of that is to make sure that uh, finances are not an obstacle for anyone and so the um, the registration fee for so if you don't pay anything to apply but if you are accepted you do have to pay to register but the registration fee is fifty dollars which is you know unheard of for <laughs> an international festival <laughs> But because I don't want that to be, um, you know, a hindrance for anyone. I can't afford to go because the registration fees are. So it's five zero, just fifty dollars, um, and you know, it, it just people sometimes try to make money off conferences. We barely break even every year, and we, we get uh, grants from the Mississippi Arts Commission, National Endowment for the Arts. Thank you very much for the support. Wonderful. So, um, and of course, the Mississippi University for Women as well. So that's how we make it happen. But but anyway, and so um, you go to mewu slash music by women. Um, that's the festival website and you click on submissions and then you choose which category you want paper, lecture recital, performance or score. Um, and then you submit if you're submitting uh, paper or a lecture recital or a performance, then obviously you don't put your name, but you do list if you're submitting as a performer, you do list the composer name and work on this, you know, you were the composer. <laughs> which in this case you would be submitting as a composer anyway. So, um, and then you submit a sample of, if, if you are performing a sample of yourself performing, if you're doing a paper, just an abstract, if you're doing lecture recital, an abstract and a sample. Um, and if you're doing a performance, it's program notes and a uh, performance sample. And then if you are a composer, you submit um, a score anonymously and then you submit a recording and it's okay to have a MIDI one. Sometimes people don't have an actual, sometimes they don't have anything. I, I cannot tell you how many handwritten scores, this is true story i have sent and, and they always get picked they always get picked so um i don't want anyone to worry that if, if they don't have the best because people ask me every year do i have to have this mic or that i'm like no 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 it's, it's fine you know this is this is a, a festival of inclusion <laughs> so we don't exclude people who don't have you know the best technological savviness or whatever and that to me that is the the, the most touching thing when i have composers calling me on my office phone saying i'm trying to submit i can't do this can you talk me through it and i said that i talk them through it and you know it's their first festival it's the first thing they've ever submitted to because a lot of times you have to be a member of this organization. You have to pay this fee. You have to do this. You have, you know, it's just, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is discouraging, right? And so it's discouraging. I want people to apply. Yeah, it's wonderful. I mean, you, as going to that, you know, people, you know, just shy away from that, those things because they don't have access to them. And I think that's mm -hmm. one of the biggest issues with this industry at times. It's just like most people don't have access to it mm -hmm. to perform or be involved in it. It becomes so elite, elitist. Um, exactly. Or, yeah. Yeah, and I think that I mean, there are lots of people out there who are trying to debunk that stereotype, but it's so deep rooted in the traditions of where it comes from. And I really, I love that you're one of those people, and you are. You're someone that's trying to include everyone, and it's fantastic. So you know, you teach a lot of students. You have tons of people that you kind of mentor because I would imagine as an academic professor. 
part of your job not only to teach them the skills that they need to be successful you're also somehow like a mentor to them you know you try to help you know foster their career or them as a, a person so do you have, what advice do you see yourself giving someone who's wanting to pursue a career in the arts a, a career in music do you give them specific words of wisdom that you have either heard yourself or that you have discovered through experience and you make sure to bestow upon them because you wish you'd been told that earlier on? Well, the first thing is one of the most disheartening things when I go recruiting for our program at the W is to hear students say, I don't want to go into music even though I love it because there's no money in music. And, you know, I, <laughs> I actually started a vlog on my YouTube channel, Julia Matikova, if you want to, uh, if you want to, um, but follow my channel. Um, but and the vlog is about my life because I want people to know that you can't have a life in music and it is a beautiful life and you can support yourself doing it. And to hear someone say that is, is just, you know, it breaks my heart. And so my advice is if this is your passion, if this is what you cannot live without, then yes, you can do it. Yes, it is a viable career option. So don't be afraid. That's my advice. You yeah. have to work hard. You have to be creative. You have to find your niche. Right? No, you cannot play the same thing in the same way that everybody else has done for centuries. No, you have to, you have to be unique in some way. You have to have something to say right? Um, and figure out a good way of saying it. But once you do that, then I, I think you, you can be very successful. And the life of music is a beautiful life. I cannot imagine doing anything else. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine you know, having any other career. And um, so I guess my advice is number one, please do it. <laughs> Don't, don't say this is, you know, not for me. This is something you're really passionate about. Please pursue your passion. Absolutely. And the second advice um, I've heard uh, from Dino Getzo. He was a professor at NYU, a composition professor, actually. But he, he said at one point, um, be open to opportunities. You know, be open to opportunities. And I've carried that with me my whole life. If someone invites you to do something or invites you to play something or do something that you're like, I've never done that. I don't know how to do that. Just do it, you know? If, if you can, try it because you never know where that's going to lead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I would say those two things. And the th um, I guess the third thing is I talked about advocacy a little bit. I think it's very important to be an advocate for music, for classical music, for women in music, and be an advocate for yourself as a musician. Absolutely. Uh, be an advocate for the arts. We need those. Um, because a lot of people just who are not within our field, they, they don't understand how serious what we do is, how rigorous it is, how, what it takes. And I think it's very important for us, this is why I started this vlog on my YouTube channel, to be outspoken about it, to let people know that it's not just like we're hit by this lightning of inspiration, all of a sudden we can do any. No, it's work, but it is a work of love because we love doing it. Um, but I think if more people realized how serious it was, maybe the arts would be treated with a little bit more respect and funding. <laughs> Especially in this, because I know in Europe, it's slightly different because it's funded by the government there and it's yeah. here to, you know, pursue that and have some more sustainability and stability. Mm -hmm. um, those are wonderful pieces of advice, especially the point about, you know, being open to op opportunities because mm -hmm. As a person who has pursued opera singing and you know has gone gotten degrees and has done you know young artist programs, um, I there have been times where I have come across opportunities or jobs and I never even knew existed or mm -hmm. a possibility. And it's so fun. It's so it's just very you know inspirational to keep going. You know when those things happen work out for you because you never know life is just magical in that way um, and I would also add don't be afraid you know if you right? have a crazy idea to do something yeah just exactly. ask do it you can you know if you have this passion I, I don't know when I was in grad school I really wanted to play with an orchestra and I put together my own orchestra twice you know you just go and ask people people will support you if you have you know like for example for the festival all the performers at the festival who play new music works, they're all volunteers and they're all top notch professional musicians. And I couldn't, I tell my students, you better go to these concerts because I can't afford to bring these people here as guest artists, but here they are performing <laughs> for free. Uh, and all the concerts are free and open to the public too, I should say. So anyone can hear the, these beautiful performers performing this amazing music, but you know, it's, if you ask, it's, that's another secret. I mean, you're a performer, so, so this is different. But a lot of times I talk to people at um, professional, who organize professional events, and they, they, 
why why don't more performers apply for things? Because well, maybe they don't want to sit there and fill out these long application forms and submit it. But if you ask them, hey, do you want to play this? They'll say yeah, you know. <laughs> so don't be afraid to reach out and tap someone to do something because. Yeah. You never know where that might lead. Never know. Exactly. That's so wonderful. And um, I know you've mentioned a couple, Cecile Chaminade. Do you have other women composers that are your, you love that you want to give more limelight to, whether they're past composers, performers, or current? Who are some of your favorite? So my favorite uh, composer, of course, Cecile Chaminade, but also Teresa Carreño is someone who I really love and love performing. She was originally from Venezuela, but sort of citizen of the world. She lived everywhere and had a career everywhere as a pianist and, and composed a lot of music. And what I what I love about these women, I should say my third one is Olga Harris, my mom. Um, oh. what, I, what I love about these women is that they're really true role models for girls because not only were they amazing composers, performers, just people, they live these incredible lives. And when I look for inspiration, I look at them because I think if they can do that a hundred years ago, you know, <laughs> that I can certainly do that now. Absolutely. And, Definitely. And, you know, I just, I also, um, I always tell my students, you know, you want to be like, as a, as a pianist, you're taught and you have to be in the right frame of mind when you perform, you have to practice for, you know, 12 hours a day. You do this. And yeah. here comes Teresa Carreño, who would, you know, sail on a ship from the U.S. to Europe, would have to get off the boat and go and perform, not having played for days. And, blah, and then that's how she, you know, I mean, this, this was life and she was very successful. Just, just be brave, you know, be prepared, but be brave and, and don't, right. don't wonder like, why am I the first? Cause you're not the first, you know, they were doing it <laughs> way before you. With way less you know, technology and way less access to things. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I like to say brave, be brave because courage is something we have to practice. It's something mm -hmm. that we don't naturally have all the time. So practicing courage on a daily basis is so important, especially with this type of career where you're constantly being vulnerable, constantly putting yourself out there in front of people who don't know you. Um, so that's such a wonderful point to make. Oh my gosh. Um, and so that's something we all have. I always tell my students, you know, students who've never performed in front of people and whatnot, I always say, it takes so much courage just to get on that stage and stay on it. There's nothing that's preventing you from literally walking off, right? You right. like, I'm not gonna push you on stage. I'm not gonna keep you on stage. You know, you know, it's, it's not yeah, a person. But you choose, yeah. I mean, but you choose to do it, and so you're already such a courageous person. Just think yeah. about that. You know? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Oh my. So I have a, a question. Are there any other festivals specifically dedicated to women in this field? Um, I haven't really done tons of research, to be honest, because this is actually the first one I've heard of. Is your festival? Mm -hmm. You have knowledge about yes. That? So there is another festival, which is a festival that I participate in regularly, the Hartford Festival of Women Composers in yep. Hartford, Connecticut. Yep. Um, so that's, that's one. And then also I'm on the board of the International Alliance of Women in Music, and they have a conference that happens every a couple of years or three years. So that they just had a conference that happened in Oregon that I attended and performed in. Love so, um, yeah. Yeah. So projects you have coming up for yourself are you because you're on summer break right now are mm -hmm. you still teaching working performing what's your schedule like these days so i just performed in june at the international alliance for women conference um but That's right now i'm i'm working on recording um, a solo album uh this will be my fourth Perfect. album since i've been at the w i have a solo album uh, a duo album another two piano album and a solo album is all women composers celebration of women in music uh, second album to to duo album. It's four hands and two pianos with my husband Valentin Bogdan, who's also a pianist. Um, it's it's kind of an eclectic mix of men and women composers. The third album, Music by Women, it's an all two piano album, all music by women composers. So it's Cecil Chaminade and and um, Amy Beach and, and Olga Harris oh. um, and Madeline Dring. All kinds of good things on that album. You can check it out available everywhere. Um, and then this album will also be solo music by women composers. And this album will feature Chaminade, Teresa Carreño, uh, Fanny Hensel, Fanny Mendelssohn Hensel, Olga Harris. So what kind of is your mom composed? Is she composed for specific instruments or is she like a variety? 
a variety, um, lots of chamber music, uh, solo kind of sonatas and various uh, pieces for various instruments, uh, lots of uh, vocal music, piano music, as I mentioned, solo works. She has several piano concerti. She has symphonic music. So very eclectic. Um, she's neo-romantic. So beautiful melodies with some dissonance for that flavor. <laughs> Uh, it's yeah it's, it's beautiful music that's one I have, to, I have to check her out i'm so excited we're planning to plug all of the composers that you've mentioned and make a post about it and get that information out there for people to see and to know about because it's very important the work you're doing is what we need so thank you so much for doing the hard work the work that is needed to be done and it's been so lovely talking to you um was there anything else that you wanted to touch on or any other questions or if anyone watching has a question feel free to shoot it out uh, well, I, I, I would like to add that if anyone is interested in checking out the program of the festivals, all of our past programs are on the festival website, MEW.U Social Music by Women. You can just click on the year, past festivals. And in uh, 2021, because of the pandemic, we were virtual. And so in 21, because my goal is to get the music out there, I decided instead of trying to do lecture recitals, papers and whatnot, we would just do concerts. So we had 31 concerts. We had a concert every day for the entire month of March. And they are all available on our website and our YouTube channel, which is Music by Women Festival. So um, I'd like to just pitch that as a resource for anyone researching Music by Women. And I tried programming those things eclectically too. So it's not just um, you know a new music concert or whatever. So if you go on this uh, Music by Women Festival YouTube on our website and you see everything, you'll see 31 concerts and they're not uh, as long as the festival concerts sometimes run two hours <laughs> There's a lot of music. these are shorter these are between 30 minutes and an hour and a half but 31 concerts of music by women composers so if anyone ever asks where can you buy music go there <laughs> yeah, because that is such an amazing resource that you've provided for people and I'm excited to go check it out myself because I'm actually wanting to maybe put on a recital at some point in New York of just women composers so thank you for plugging that I also meant to ask about the pandemic so your festivals in March right usually mm -hmm. have March so in 2020 what did you guys do how did you handle that that's that was a crazy time so in 2020, our festival was the last thing that happened before everything shut down. So we actually had it. It was literally, I think, maybe the first weekend in March. So it literally, it happened, and the next week happened, then everything shut down. So it was really kind of sweet this year because a lot of people were telling me, because we had it in person, of course, this year in 22, and last in 21, it was virtual. So people were saying, 2020, the festival was my last in-person thing, and now this is my first back in-person thing. <laughs> welcoming people back um, after after the pandemic and we were the ones saying goodbye right before um, so no so we had it in person and you know at that time we didn't know much about things we, you know we had sanitizer we tried doing social distancing we tried having you know kind of separation of food for the reception and stuff like that prepackaged food but we were able to have it and luckily no one got sick from the festival I remember. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah and then 21 we had the 31 concerts which I do encourage everyone to check out because it was um, you know, it was a, a lot of, it was a lot of work to put together, um, and, um, big shout out. I think he's listening to Jonathan Levin. He was the person actually putting all these videos together. He was the festival kind of production person. Um, and, um, but it, you know, it was, it was a, to create this repository of, of music by women composers online was, you know, it was important and I'm glad that we did it. It, it really, um, I think will make a difference because anyone looking for music by women composers will find it and, and there's something for every instrument on there and everyone did such an amazing job and we really came together and if anyone had problems, didn't know how to use Dropbox, didn't know how to upload this, didn't know how to set up that, you know, I was on the phone with them talking them through it because I was determined if anyone wants to get this music out there, we're going to make it happen. <laughs> so amazing. I mean, that resource is so great. And I can guarantee you after what's happened this past week, you're going to have a lot more people coming to you for these resources to make this more amplified because it needs to be. And it's sad to have something like, you know, a Supreme Court decision, maybe move people to make a change. But it sometimes these types of things have to have to happen. And um, yeah, so I really appreciate your time and talking. And I've so loved getting to know more about the festival and I can't wait to check out the resources and um yeah Julia Mortakova you are doing everything that we need right now and I really appreciate you and your work and I just hope that you have a great evening thank you so much I really enjoyed speaking with you do yes thank you and I hope to see you maybe one day down at
Columbus, if I'm home visiting, if I can come to the festival, I would love that one day. And um, Helios Opera would love to maybe report from there. Who's to say? You never know. Just got to take those. Yeah. <laughs> love to have you. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, I hope you have a great weekend. It's so nice to meet you. And thank you so much for your time and for your knowledge and everything that you offer for us. Thank, thank you me. so much. Thank you for your work. Oh, thank you. I'll, we'll talk to you soon. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye, Julia.